everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I, I feel so much at home here looking at where everyone is logging in from. Uh, the, the, the diversity of our, our group today is very similar to what we experience in our classrooms at Hull. So uh, I'm looking forward to spending a, a bit of time with you today. And uh, we're going to be talking about the notion of grit. Um, grit is really defined as persistence and perseverance to achieve goals over a period of time uh, despite obstacles. So it has to do with being tenacious, it has to do with self-knowledge, and it has to do with performance. So we'll be talking about some techniques that we use at HALT during our, our teaching uh, to help encourage the development of grit, and especially during these times of transition today. So without, let's see, without further ado, I, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm uh, Professor Pamela Campagna. Uh, I work at the Holt Boston campus here in Massachusetts in the U.S. and I'm a, a certified management consultant and uh, I've also got uh, a history working in industry as well. Uh, I've also been a professor at a number of, of various uh, universities uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and in Europe. And you'll see that a lot of the professors combine uh, experience in the field working with businesses or nonprofit organizations together with their teaching. In terms of education, I have an MBA in international business as well as work uh, on my, my doctoral degree. And in terms of the work that I do at HALT, I teach a, a number of different courses in uh, postgraduate and undergraduate. So international business, uh, social marketing, leadership. We have an entire leadership curriculum that's consistent across all of the programs. So if you're interested in the master's in international business or master's in international marketing or finance or data analytics or MBA, you will have uh, uh, exposure and access to leadership development courses. Uh, I also teach uh, some of the electives which are coming up uh, this summer, uh, consulting electives and persuasion and influence. You'll also notice that a lot of the faculty are very involved with the student body on all of the campuses. So students uh, put together clubs on every campus and uh, they typically have a faculty advisor. So uh, I work with the consulting club on campus. There's a women in business club. Uh, and, uh, and there are also activities outside of the campus that our students take advantage of where we advise them. So uh, in the Boston campus, there is an IXL uh, Innovation Olympics, which is outside of Holt. But on the Boston campus in particular, we have such a large opportunity to work with a number of different universities and attend different events as a student. I'm a little bit biased to the Boston campus. Uh, you'll also notice that our faculty are very involved in research. Uh, myself particularly, my research uh, has a number of different uh, elements to it. Uh, I focus quite a bit on women in leadership, and I've written a couple of business cases uh, around women in leadership, specifically in the Middle East. And then I also work on looking at psychological safety in teams and how team selection and team performance correlate with one another uh, based on the element of psychological safety and uh, acclimation uh, that students and individuals in industry experience. So that's me. Uh, I also uh, have a, a, I mentioned uh, experience in practice. I have a consulting business, which I started uh, about 23 years ago. The company is called Blue Sage Consulting. Uh, it's a business management consulting firm. It's a certified uh, women-owned business. And I do work with clients uh, around the world. And over the past 20 some odd years, I've worked with clients in uh, pharmaceuticals, in technologies, in services industries. And one of the nice things that we see in working out in the field day to day with clients and businesses and nonprofit organizations is that we are able to bring those experiences then 
back into the classroom working with our students. In addition, it helps for a very strong network. Uh, so you'll see that, um, that many of our faculty and our students maintain relationships and connect and network not only while our students are in school, but once they leave. Uh, I mentioned to, uh, to Stephen yesterday on the phone, I, I received a, um, a LinkedIn message yesterday from a student of mine who works uh, right now in, I think he's in Manila. He may actually be in the Philippines, yes. Um, and uh, he works for a large consultancy, I won't say which one, but uh, he was a student of mine in 2016. And he dropped me a note and he mentioned that he thought about the class, something about our global strategy class that we had, and just wanted to check in and say hello. So you, you, you'll see that the HALT community uh, is, is robust and, and it's not just when our students are in the classroom with us, but also beyond. So now I'd like to get an idea of who we have out there. Uh, so in order to do this, um, I'd like to, uh, to use the, the chat feature, which Stephen reviewed with us. And I would like you each to answer this question to get a sense of how you deal with change and transition. Don't overthink it. Whatever comes to mind, just jot it down in the chat and, and chat to everyone. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to do this. And you can start whenever you're ready. Embrace it, try new things, winging it, <laughs> growing, planning and meditation. So, so maybe some personal self-care, looking for opportunities to learn, maybe pacing ourselves, planning and over planning. That's interesting. They came back to back those answers, huh? Embracing change, staying calm, so maybe personal discipline, increasing resiliency, Adapt, improvise, and overcome. That sounds familiar. Being open-minded. Welcoming change. Reflection. Assessing the situation. So it, notice here that some folks have their own personal way of dealing with change and transition that have to do with internal capabilities. And some have to do with looking outside of themselves. Restart, restart from zero. That's interesting. Overcoming fear. So sometimes when we deal with change and transition, we need to address the fear of it all. Maybe there's frustration, resistance, or anxiety and confusion. Listen to others and learn from mistakes. Use emotional intelligence. Excellent. Mental health. Taking a mental health break. Good, good. Thank you everyone for, for your responses here. Um, you, you may notice how widely varied they are uh, and, and how we deal with change and transition is a, a very personal thing. Um, not only in a, a typical setting, but especially in today's world, today's world of change. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, for, for the faculty personally uh, at HALT, um, when the virus started to really pick up, uh, we were given, um, I think, 72 hours notice that we were going to be shifting to, uh, to a virtual uh, classroom. And this was in March. Uh, and uh, so how we adapt to change, how we approach it, um, can very much be a, a function of how prepared we are for it. And these are some skills that we can develop. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more today. So when we think about when we think about uh, resilience, how do we build a sense of, of resilience? And actually that's the last comment here, increasing resiliency. How do you do that specifically? How do you do that? 
um, part of it has to do with our mindset. Now you may say, well, what, what is a mindset? Well, we're, we'll talk about that in a minute. So the first thing we're going to do is to look at what influences how we learn, because this is all part of learning. So what can influence how we learn? How do we develop that resiliency? Well, a lot of it has to do with our mindset. How do we develop a mindset whereby we look at the challenges and try to determine and analyze how we might approach them differently than the last time? We look back on how we have handled conflict, for example, and we think about how we might do it differently or the same in the future. This is a lot of the work, by the way, that we do at HALT, especially in our leadership classes, but in all of our classrooms, in all of our courses, uh, in all of our programs. So what I'd like to do next is to get a sense of how your mindset can impact your level of resiliency. Is everybody ready? Okay. So Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to hand it over to you. I think you're my co-pilot driving our poll. Yeah. So this is going to be a poll. There are four questions here. I'd like you to read each one of them and mark whether you strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, somewhat agree, strongly agree, or are neutral. And use the scroll bar here to reach all of the questions. And we'll have about 45 seconds to do this. Stephen, everything running on your side? Yeah, it's looking good. Um, okay. more people are doing them. Um, just let's give a couple of more seconds, I would say, so the numbers get up. I can see right now 45% answered. Okay. All of them. So a few more seconds, I would say. You're reaching 60%. Okay. So I would say like I can end the poll right now, just like the last few people I would say. Let's give it about five more seconds. Okay, no problem. All right, I would say um, I should end the poll now. And then last few people. Okay, great. And I would end it now. And here we go. And um, do you want me to share the results already? Um, yes. Why, why don't you go ahead? I'm stopping my share. So why don't you go ahead, Stephen? Okay, I'm sharing the results. Um, so you should okay. see the results right now. I think you can still okay, share great. your screen. All right. So everybody can see it still. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see uh, how everyone responded here. So these were these were questions about how you look at intelligence and how how you view things. Um, and this is really your mindset. So the first question: Your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't change very much. So it looks like almost half of you strongly disagreed, 
and uh, between the, the first two, um, pretty much disagreed, 77%. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this is coupled with the second question. You can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. So the second question, again, 75% uh, of you are leaning towards disagreement. So what do we notice about these two questions? Just put a response in the chat. Is there anything you notice about these two questions and the results that we got here? It's about growth mindset, yes. Change is good. It's all in the mind. It's, it's in how you approach it. And if you're adaptable and focus on your, your growth, you can influence the outcomes. By learning new things, our way of thinking and intelligence is impacted exactly. Yes, the things that we learn can change how we approach the problems. If you're willing to be open-minded and, and look outside of yourself, push your limits, challenge yourself. Yes, Some, someone just uh, noticed how, how the questions were phrased. These are actually questions, uh, by the way, that were designed um, by Dr. Carol Dweck, um, who is a, um, a, a professor that has done a tremendous amount of research around growth mindset. So these first two questions, these take a look at whether or not our mindset is fixed. So these first two questions are around a fixed mindset. And then look at the third and fourth question. No matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it quite a bit. And look at the numbers here. 86% agreed with the statement and compare that also to the 82% that agreed with the fourth statement. Fourth statement. You can always substantially change how intelligent you are. So if you notice the difference between the first two and the last two statements, that really shows the difference between a fixed mindset, the first two questions, and a growth mindset, the second two questions. So in a fixed mindset, the consequences of my behavior are outside of my circle of control. But in a growth mindset, there's a belief that a person's abilities can change over time as a result of perseverance and practice. So the real question then becomes, how is it that we foster and develop this growth mindset? How is it that we go from A fixed mindset, the belief that your potential was determined at birth and there's not much you can do about it, to a growth mindset. And one of the ways that we look at developing a growth mindset is really to look at the steps that we may take along the way. This is a quote that I, I wanted to share with you from uh, Dan Chambliss, he's a, a sociologist and has been for many decades. He talks about how performance is really a confluence of dozens of small skills or activities. So think about that. Small skills or activities. What are some of the skills that you have that maybe you hadn't noticed before that you maybe learned or stumbled upon that have become habits for you? You may be very good at managing a lot of disparate pieces of information. Or you may have the skill of approaching strangers and engaging in conversation. So what are some of the things that have been drilled into habit? And then they're fitted together in a synthesized whole. So there's nothing extraordinary or superhuman in any one of those actions, only the fact that they are done consistently and correctly, and together they produce excellence. So what we do in the one-year programs at HALT is we work on uh, developing these skills, identifying them, um, expanding them, and working on them consistently so that they produce excellence, whatever excellence means to you. 
Excellence could be grades. Excellence could be coming out of your shell and meeting new people from other parts of the world. Um, but this is, this is really the, the, um, uh, the silver bullet, um, as, as they call it, which is really not a silver bullet. And, and so the way that we put this all together in our programs at HALT, we start with a, a framework to help guide personal development. We call it the HALT DNA. And this is a, a leadership development framework um, that you see in, in many organizations. Um, so many businesses have core competency models that they update regularly. Uh, they organize them in a certain way. Um, what we've done is something similar, is we've taken uh, teaching and learning into consideration and we've developed the, uh, the health DNA based on three specific elements. Uh, the first element is thinking, and, and that's really the, the foundation for thinking has to do with psychological concepts. So that's one. The second competency in the whole DNA is communications. So we take the thinking components and we really develop them from a sociolo sociological perspective. And then thirdly, we take a look at the anthropological perspective and we develop the team building section. So there are three specific elements in the leadership development framework, thinking, communicating, and team building. And underneath each of those competencies, we work with our students to develop skills. And the specific skills under thinking, for example, are how to show self-awareness. Somebody mentioned in the chat box, uh, emotional intelligence. Yes, indeed, that's a big piece of it. So how, how do we show self-awareness? What, what does that mean to us? And how do we deal with change? That's most of what we're talking about today. And dynamic thinking. How do we demonstrate dynamic thinking? Dynamic thinking is the combination of critical and creative thinking. How do we demonstrate that? And then when we talk about communication, speaking and listening skillfully. This has to do with active listening. It has to do with how we present ourselves, how we influence and persuade. And we have a, a lot of opportunity to practice and develop each of these throughout the, the one year program. And then finally, team building. Um, over the course of a year, most of our students have the opportunity to get together in six or eight or even 10 teams. Think about this, cross um, uh, geographical teams. So you're working with students from different parts of the world, much like everyone who's on this call. And that gives you the opportunity to work on um, developing relationships with fellow students, um, to practice how you might influence and, and improve the productivity and motivate other folks that are on your team, and also to, to deal with conflict, which is inevitable. But when you consider about the opportunities that you have to practice all of this in a team setting, in a global environment, it really gives you an advantage then when you go to interview for your next job in that you have the experience of already working in a lot of multicultural teams. Um, and and that's, that's very exciting. So the, um, the next thing I'd, I'd like to do now is just pause for a second. Uh, so I, I've said quite a few things here uh, about the whole DNA, uh, some of the components, uh, the three competencies and the skills. And so now just a, a very, uh, a, a very quick, uh, quick poll. Stephen, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So um, just to, to be sure that we are all, uh, that we have all internalized this, go right ahead, Stephen. Okay. Here we go. Very quickly, from the list below, select the word that is not one of the competencies of the whole DNA. And you have uh, five seconds to do so. Great to see so many people choosing their choice right now. And I, I think we're going, going to have a, 
fairly very <laughs> one-sided answer, but great, great to see that. So let's give a couple more minutes or seconds. So last few people, please. Okay. We have 80% now. So last few people, please make your choice. Okay. What do you say, Pamela? Should we proceed? Yes. Can you, like roughly everyone has done it. Um, okay. So one, two, and three, and I end the poll <laughs> and I share the results. Uh, or do you want to? Uh, why don't you go ahead and share, Stephen? Sure. Here we go. Okay. Excellent. So ninety-two percent uh, of of the folks. Yes, risk taking. Now. Risk taking um, may be something that uh, that you choose to develop up to a certain level or not, uh, but it is not one of the core competencies of the whole DNA. So uh, I, that was a that was an easy question I, I know, uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of of uh, when we teach virtually when you attend classes. Um, how we interact with students. Um, typically, everyone has their video on, um, which is a requirement, um, and we engage in breakout rooms and have um, a lot more uh, two-way conversation than is uh, uh, available here for us today. Um, and and that's part of uh, that's part of the the limitless learning. So. Um, Wherever you start, whether it's um, virtually uh, at home uh, or if it's in a whole classroom in the fall, um, you can start your programs and then when you are able to rejoin your cohort, you can do so. So with that, I'd like to, um, let me go back and share my screen. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you to reflect on a couple of things and I'd like you to think about specific action steps. Think about one action step that you may be able to take to cultivate grit. We covered a, a number of different topics here in a very short period of time, but think about specific action steps. Make them as specific as you can and put a time frame against them and jot that down. And if you could just add it into the chat, that would be great. So an action step, something specifically. Listen carefully to other individuals so they feel understood, and you can create something from there. Thank you, Pierre. Niraj? Improved communication and think in the right path to achieve the goals. Think about how we might get specific. Learn to listen actively to new points of view. Are there specific time frames? Think about a time frame that you might be able to do some of these in. Working out more regularly to strengthen my body and mind to be more resilient. Thank you for that. Be on time in meetings, that's a big one. And, and we have a team charter that teams set before they begin work, and that's always on the list, is being on time. Make planning, make and stick to a schedule. Practice model thinking. Have clear goals, short and long-term, good. Controlling emotions in times of stress and high pressure. Now that might be one where you you take that particular sentence and maybe build that out. So is there something specific that you can do to control your stress or your anxiety? So maybe a, an example might be, um, when I become stressed, I write it down so that I can note where I was, how I was feeling, and what the situation is. And I'm going to do that 
for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, I'm going to try to see if there are any specific themes or patterns that emerge. So that's an example of being specific and, and being specific and putting in time against it. So with that said, um, we, could, we could keep going for, for a, a long time here. Thank you for the, the continued uh, input and in chat. Um, yes, learn to understand people's culture and background and how it impacts their ideas. Excellent. We have a great opportunity to do that at HALT. So uh, with that said, I'm going to um, uh, thank everyone for their, their attention and their time. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of, uh, these are students of mine uh, from uh, last two years ago. They came and they spoke to um, some, uh, some students that uh, came over from China. But uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us. Thank you for your attention. I hope to see you in one of our classrooms or, or in our virtual learning space. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Stephen.